Hello, everyone. Welcome back to my channel, Queen BSP. And thank you for tuning in for another chapter of my book, Scientology Abuse at the Top, with added commentary. Um, I hope you're finding it interesting. Um, it's helping me going through these chapters as well, um, because it's putting me back in the mindset of um, what was going on at the time, but also with a viewpoint that I have now looking back at it. So it's pretty interesting and it's healing for me. So um, anyway, thank you for being with me on this journey. Um, the last chapter we did was chapter 10, which was assault and battery um, with lots of specifics about David Miscavige and what he did to my peers. Um, and now what we're going to do is chapter 11 and chapter 11 talks about how David Miscavige totally spun the tragedy of Lisa McPherson's death at the Flagland base. All right. Chapter 11, Miscavige spins Lisa McPherson's tragedy. One of the most publicly recognized tragedies for Scientology was the death of parishioner Lisa McPherson. Lisa had been a Scientologist for about 18 years, yet died a gruesome death on December 5, 1995, in the hands of the church in Clearwater, Florida. She was only 36 years old. Lisa died of a pulmonary embolism, and upon inspection by the coroner, she was found to be underweight, severely dehydrated, and full of bruises and bug bites. The state's medical examiner indicated that Lisa was a victim of negligent homicide. The Church of Scientology was therefore indicted on two felony charges, abuse and or neglect of a disabled adult and practicing medicine without a license. These charges were later dropped after the state's medical examiner changed the cause of death from undetermined to an accident on June 13, 2000. A civil lawsuit brought by her family against the church was settled on May 28, 2004. New evidence has since been uncovered regarding details of Lisa's treatment, lack of, and Scientology's cover-up that went on behind the scenes, which were exposed in the St. Petersburg Times story entitled, Death in Slow Motion. See tampabay.com forward slash Scientology. While not directly responsible for the flag land base where Lisa was being handled, quote unquote, I was in the watchdog committee and observed various aspects of the fallout from this tragic occurrence. First of all, Miscavige was in Clearwater for quite some time before this incident. He was inspecting Flag's technical application, finding that from the highest trained counselors down, none of them apparently knew what they were doing. Miscavige started to bypass the technical hierarchy of the flag service organization and ordered several staff members to be removed from post and sent to the rehabilitation project force. He enforced penalties for any counselor who miscalled e-meter reads, and he was watching from another room noting mistakes personally. Each auditing room was equipped with a look-in, listen-in, and talk-in system so technical seniors could observe any session ongoing in the building and direct counselors if needed mid-session. Boy, was that thing abused. Miscavige even took it upon himself to personally direct specific case actions be taken with Lisa McPherson because he knew best. Two of my very close friends told me they were with Miscavige at the time when he personally wrote out instructions for Lisa to attest to the state of clear, one who no longer has a reactive mind. One was the commanding officer of the CMO in Clearwater, Tom DeVocht, and the other was the chief officer of the FSO, 
Don Jason. The CMO is the Commodore's Messenger Organization, and the FSO is the Flag Service Organization. So both of those were senior organizations at the Flag Land Base. We heard of a Scientologist who went nuts, quote unquote, and died at the Flag Land Base. We were initially given no specifics as to what happened. We were just instructed to flourish and prosper by getting our statistics up as the situation was being handled by RTC and the Office of Special Affairs, so we didn't need to worry about it. The WDC member over the flag land base was in Clearwater full-time at the time, so we didn't see her at our daily WDC meetings to get any updates. However, what I did see was the former RTC representatives for the flag land base arrived back to the int base. They were both busted out of RTC, and one was placed out at the Happy Valley Ranch where the Int RPF had been located. One of them was later shipped out of the country to Australia, not her home country. When Scientology was indicted in November 1998, David Miscavige was rarely at the Int base. He spent most of his time in Clearwater directing the RTC and OSA team handling this case. At the imp base, we received weekly financial demands on Sea Org reserves to help fund the legal costs, which were astronomical. I mean, uh, Matt said that, you know, at the flag land base, because he was over treasury, they had a reserve for emergencies or whatever of $50 million, and that entire thing was drained for this Lisa McPherson handling. That's not including what we spent at Sea Org Reserves or weekly income that came in. A few times, Miscavige came back to tell the WDC members and those in the executive strata how much he was having to personally bypass and handle the Lisa McPherson situation while we just sat around at our desks getting nothing done. In two meetings with WDC, Miscavige brought along a dummy of a human body that opened to display all of the organs he said that Lisa had a blood clot that killed her, so he was having to learn every part of the human anatomy to defend the case. Yeah, he was always trying to impress us with how much he had to do and how much he had to know and, you know, how much we weren't doing anything <laughs> as he was saving the day. Meantime, he's the one who created this muck. Miscavige told us that he's off saving the day for Scientology because if we lost that case, it would set a precedent where the church would open themselves up for wrongful death suits in the future. So they were going to do whatever it took to win. It has since come to light that incriminating evidence against the church was destroyed prior to the case going to trial by former RTC staff member, Marty Rathbun, who spoke out on the matter to the St. Petersburg Times in June, 2009. The criminal charges were finally dropped against Scientology because the medical examiner supposedly couldn't be trusted to confidently testify in the case. How convenient. <laughs> to David Miscavige, the fact that the charges were dropped was a major victory. How he could spin the mistreatment and subsequent death of Lisa McPherson into a triumph was nothing short of astonishing. In June 2000, Scientologists gathered on board the Freewinds to celebrate this victory. Miscavige addressed the crowd, and in his speech, he actually classified the McPherson trial as an assault on the church by everyone from the mafia to the German government to pharmaceutical companies and even the Clearwater police. Every event Miscavige does is recorded, reproduced, and sent to Scientology churches around the world so they can hold similar events and show the video to all of their public as well. The registrars for the International Association of Scientologists, IAS, use these videos to convince parishioners to make donations to help finance the church's continued fight for religious freedom. The following is how David Miscavige personally described this victory at the IAS event aboard the Free Winds that June. Okay, so now realize this is David Miscavige talking. Okay, so I'm going to be reading what he actually said at this event because I transcribed it and um, that it was produced and sent out to all organizations around the world. So this is what he actually said and actually tried to make other people believe. <laughs> 
When speaking of ethics presence and unkillability, the recent events emanating from Clearwater couldn't be more on point because while the full story and all details behind that assault contain enough intrigue to fill several James Bond novels, there is actually a greater story and that story has to do with real application of PTSSP tech and the ultimate weapon against suppression, flourish and prosper. Okay, so the PTSSP tech is the technology written by Elron Hubbard covering how to handle a potential trouble source, PTS, or suppressive person, SP. A PTS is someone connected to a suppressive person. There are several types or classifications of a PTS, such as a type A, which is anyone with a family member, friend, or associate who is antagonistic toward the person or Scientology. A PTS type 3 is someone who has gone insane. Okay, this is David continuing to talk, saying, to put that attack, okay, <laughs> let's just go back and look at this. <laughs> when speaking of ethics presence and unkillability, the recent events emanating from Clearwater, events, meaning a parishioner died, couldn't be more on point, because while the full story and all details behind that assault, that assault, this person dying is an assault on, on Scientology. Contains enough intrigue to fill several James Bond novels. There is actually a greater story, and that story has to do with real application of PTSSP tech and the ultimate weapon against suppression because Scientology is being suppressed because somebody died in their care. Flourish and prosper. Good. So you're going to flourish and prosper while their family suffers because of the death of their loved one. Anyway, to put that attack in perspective, here are the actual events as we now discovered. It began in 1993, and specifically with the recognition of the church with the IRS. Now let's not forget, everybody was not happy about that. So bring in a few key players. First, there's Eli Lilly, whose Prozac we were broadly exposing as the killer drug that it is. And Eli Lilly is a global pharmaceutical company and Prozac is one of the antidepressants that it distributes. Then add Germany, who are gearing up for their final solution of Scientology at that very time. And add the city of Clearwater, Florida. They had engaged in attacks against us since our arrival there. So this is all a big attack on Scientology from the German government, from uh, Clearwater, Florida. Where else? Eli Lilly. <laughs> that someone, it's so non sequitur that someone can take the death of a person under your care and say, pointing fingers every other place in the whole world. Eli Lilly, German government, the city of Clearwater. Now that's a story that could take all night, but suffice it to say that just before we purchased the Fort Harrison in the mid 1970s, a few of the big old boys had been steadily driving down property values in coordination with a certain newspaper who I won't name, but their initials are SP. Now it seems they were getting ready for the mob to bring in casino operations. Now we got the mob coming in. <laughs> Where? Of course, it would start in that city's landmark, the Fort Harrison. Needless to say, our purchase right under their nose didn't make them happy. But back to the immediate story. What you probably didn't realize is that their police department was involved in practically every assault against us for the next two decades. Okay, so now we got the police department. <laughs> okay, hold on. Now don't forget that when Canada was attacked, there was the Clearwater Police. When the IRS went after our churches and you, there was the Clearwater Police Department. And right there in Florida, the city has attempted to enact the ordinance against the church. And literally on the same day we received IRS recognition, that ordinance was also struck down in a scathing decision by the Court of Appeals. So he's got the IRS attacking, something being attacked in Canada, the mob, 
the Clearwater police attacking, German government attacking, the city of Clearwater attacking. What else? Eli Lilly. Drug companies. Okay. Have we forgotten anyone? <laughs> Let's see. Maybe, maybe there's another one in here. So October the 1st, 1993 was not a good day for the SP powers that be in Clearwater. And finally, let's add that SP newspaper to the list. Oh yeah, okay, good, St. Pete's Times. That's another one, okay? So St. Petersburg Times. Look at everybody going after Scientology, all responsible for the Lisa McPherson death. The same one that argued all of these discriminatory actions and who now had egg on their face with the city having to pay us about a million dollars in legal fees for pursuing their illegal case. And what else do we now know happened following that fateful IRS victory? Well, first, the German embassy in Washington, D.C. reported back to Germany that our tax exemption was a grave development and frantically advised all stops to be pulled in undermining our exemption. Frantically, mm-hmm. Second, Eli Lilly let loose a team of former FBI agents and PR firms to work out the most effective means to discredit Scientology. Set loose a team of former, I, oh my God. So is David Miscavige fighting Martians in his brain? He was connected to case supervising Lisa McPherson under his watch and with his personal staff supervising, Lisa McPherson had a psychotic break. She was confined per Scientology policies, kept in a room, muzzled, and, uh, and she died. She died a horrible death. If you've seen her before and after pictures, you can see just how well Scientology took care of her. Not. And where did they decide to lead their assault? In Germany, by bringing the SP government on board. They chose Clearwater because it is the home of Armeca. And what better target to attack since their losses were so great? A Mecca is a place that is regarded as the center of an activity or interest. For Scientology, their Mecca is the Flagland Base in Clearwater, Florida, where upper level services are delivered to parishioners. Further, it was the one local government in America still antagonistic to the church, with their newspaper being the only source of N theta on our recognition in 1993, quoting both the police chief and mayor's disapproval. And theta is a coined term for interbulated theta, meaning bad news, upset, or slander. So this was the stage, and these were the players that converged for the last big enemy assault in the United States. And make no mistake, that was precisely what was behind that assault. They were just looking for anything to get us because absolutely nothing the media reported about that case had any part in reality as we now know. Scientology specializes in saying, oh, it's just not true. You know, I can't tell you the specifics, but it's, it's not true and you don't have all the information. So that just kind of shuts your mind down on the subject, you know, if you're, if you're not very inquisitive um, and keep like trying to pull the string and find out what actually happened. Um, but in, as a staff member in the C organization, Everything external is handled really um, by the Office of Special Affairs, and it's only on a need-to-know basis that you would ever know anything was going on, because part of it was, you keep your attention on production, we'll handle any of the external flaps and noise and things like that, and people who are barking at our heels. So you just carried on, even though you knew that something was happening over here, but you didn't have the details and you really didn't ask about it because you stayed in your lane. <laughs> um, and so this was all we really knew aside from David Miscavige coming in and telling us a little bit about the case and how he was hand having to handle everything. Um, this is all we knew is what he said at this event. And basically 
it was a whole setup by the Clearwater Police, the mob, the St. Pete Times, uh, Eli Lilly, and everybody else in the universe. Um, and they took zero responsibility for what happened to a prisoner on their watch. The police began their inquisition, inquisition, but after their files just released this week's show, they knew there was nothing untoward from the first week. But that wouldn't stop them because they had a ready and willing ally in the local medical examiner who would conduct tests, quote unquote, to prove something was wrong. Okay, so now it's the medical examiner as well. <laughs> Now, how did she plan to get away with that? Easy. As soon as she concocted her false results, she destroyed the evidence. Literally, that's what she did. I'm not joking. This is David Miscavige saying that. Literally, that's what she did. I'm not joking. Uh, who destroyed evidence, David Miscavige? Testimony by Marty Rathman said that he was ordered to lose the documents that would be you know, incriminating. So he had them disappeared, like either shredded or whatever. Um, so, you know, look in the mirror, buddy. You're the one who did that. He continues, what else do we know? She was a heavy supporter of Prozac and couldn't stand the fact that CCHR, CCHR by name, found out about newly caused deaths of Prozac before she could say it was something else. Again, no joke. And of course, CCHR is Citizens Commission on Human Rights, uh, which is something that was co-founded in 1969 by Scientology to investigate and eradicate mental health abuse, which is something they do on a daily basis. But let's not forget the Black PR campaign is what fostered this assault. Black PR is Black Public Relations, a term used by Scientologists to mean any term or statement that smears or incorrectly, unjustifiably slanders a well-intentioned person or group. So they're thinking that they're a well-intentioned person or group and that anyone speaking out against them is Black PR. And while the first stories emanated from Clearwater, they were actually written by German reporters. Now, of course, we've known that datum for years but that's not the full story. And again, this comes from police files withheld from us until this week. These files showed the German media was secretly meeting with the police the whole time, but that's still not the big secret because it turns out those reporters were identifying themselves to the police as representatives of the German government. That's right, they were actually German intelligence. But as I said, I could give you intrigue all night. The real mystery was how the state officials ever thought they could get away with this. And the answer is simple, with generalities. <laughs> Something you specialize in, David Miscavige. By attacking the church, they didn't have to ever prove any person did anything wrong. Their only strategy was to spread enough black PR to smear everybody. Everybody, everybody is a generality, David. <laughs> and they had the perfect mouthpiece to do it, the well-named SP Times. In fact, they were hoping the church would do what any other organization does. After all, the only thing at stake, they said, was a $15,000 fine. And what any corporation does is just plead no contest. In other words, accept an injustice so as to save money in having to fight. Well, we're not any other group, and they were given one answer, wrong. In fact, we went one step further and told them, undo what you've done because it's false. Of course, they told us they never would. Our response, then we'll make you do it, just watch. Now, this was a very significant point because just winning wouldn't be good enough. We always knew we'd win. Yet how many court cases have you seen when somebody wins, but the papers say, he may have been ruled not guilty, but that doesn't mean he's innocent. That was no option for us. The only option we would accept is drop your case. 
However, considering the whole political climate, it's no generality to say attorneys and experts from one end of the country to the other said that was impossible and that it would never happen. Why did everybody think it could never happen? Well, it never does. Plus, as they correctly pointed out, this was the lengthiest investigation ever conducted, the most expensive investigation ever conducted, with the most publicity, the most black PR of any case ever in that state. Well, the rest is history because we never say never. While I could detail everything it took to make this happen, it's best summed up this way. By real Scientologists never forgetting the price of freedom. Today you can add one more first to that list I gave because that case is also now the most embarrassing case ever brought by the state because what never happens was made to happen as they were forced to drop all charges in honor of our maiden voyage on June 12, 2000. Standing ovation. But as I said at the outset, there is a bigger picture and it has to do with the real tech of handling suppression, flourish and prosper. When this began, we had an antagonistic city government, an antagonistic mayor and a still ongoing 20 year police intelligence investigation. What did we do? Flourish and prosper. We announced and began the construction of our new Mecca and the Sandcastle expansion and then continued on persisting until even that police chief ended that 20 year investigation, admitting that he couldn't find evidence to charge the church with so much as not paying a parking ticket. Oh, what a lie. But probably the best example is this. Who did the first call of congratulations come from? The city manager and then the city attorney who heads that office that used to specialize in assaulting us. And finally, the mayor himself who said, congratulations, I'm glad we won. And the end result to that suppression is this. Today, our Mecca has a safer environment than ever in history with enemies turned to friends and allies. And that's what LRH meant when he told us to flourish and prosper. Standing ovation. But even as we celebrate this latest victory, I'm just having such a hard time thinking like his brain, you know, reading this or how you could even write something like this on the death of a parishioner who was in your charge. He doesn't even mention this person's name. Um, he doesn't say, you know, um, sadly, you know, a situation happened or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he just, it's a victory. It's a victory like none other worth being congratulated over. And uh, that all of the enemies, which, you know, the list goes on and on and on, were all involved in attacking Scientology and they overcame it all. But anyway. But even as we celebrate this latest victory, let's not forget the challenges to come. For to rescue a planet from the teeth of suppression and set six billion free is to say the least, a highly adventurous undertaking. It demands supreme dedication, supreme commitment, and not a little courage. It also requires a fully cohesive and coordinated effort on the part of every Scientologist. And that's of course, what the International Association of Scientologists is all about. Applause, end of event. The video of this event can be seen on YouTube entitled Scientology Spins the Lisa McPherson Case Part 2. Well, that's what the International Association of Scientologists is all about. No, what the International Association of Scientologists is all about is a war chest uh, where you can just take in direct donations and you don't have to deliver anything as a result of that. Um, you can just take in money, take in money, take in money and spend it how you want to. The mind of a sociopath, the person who's in charge of Scientology and how he could take the death of one of his parishioners on his watch, on his property and turn it into 
an attack on the church and a victory where everyone needs to give standing ovations is just pretty mind blowing. Um, but it's very, very uh, sad and a sick situation. And so that's why I included it in my book because it really sheds light on the mind of a sociopath. I've actually just found the original event where David Miscavige makes this announcement exactly as written in my book um, to the people on the free winds, all about Lisa McPherson's case against Scientology for wrongful death. So let me show you what David Miscavige said in his own words. You have just heard how once again we have emerged victorious in countries across the planet in pursuit of the aims of Scientology. And more than any one win, the cumulative effect of our victories is even greater. Elrich explains ethics presence this way. Ethics presence is an X quality made up partly of symbology, partly of force, some now we're supposed to's, and endurance. One of the reasons the press now print what we say is that we have endured the biggest shellackings anybody could muster up. We've gained ethics presence publicly by it. Endurance asserts the truth of unkillability. We're still here, can't be unmocked. This drives the SP wild, LRH. And when speaking of ethics presence and unkillability, the recent events emanating from Clearwater couldn't be more on point. Because... Because while the full story and all details behind that assault contain enough intrigue to fill several James Bond novels, there is actually a greater story. And that story has to do with real application of PTSSP tech and the ultimate weapon against suppression, flourish and prosper. To put that attack in perspective, here are the actual events as we've now discovered. It began in 1993 and specifically with the recognition of the church by the IRS. Now, let's not forget, everybody was not happy about that. <laughs> so, so bring in a few key players. First, there was Eli Lilly, whose Prozac we were broadly exposing as the killer drug that it is. Then add Germany, who were gearing up for their final solution of Scientology at that very time, and add the city of Clearwater, Florida. They had engaged in attacks against us since our arrival there. Now, that's a story which could take all night, but suffice it to say that just before we purchased the Fort Harrison Hotel in the mid-1970s, a few of the big old boys had been steadily driving down property values in coordination with a certain newspaper who I won't name, but their initials are SP. <laughs> now, it seems, now, it seems they were getting ready for the mob to bring in casino operations, where, of course, it would start in that city's landmark, the Fort Harrison. Needless to say, our purchase right under their nose didn't make them happy. But back to the immediate story, what you probably didn't realize is that their police department was involved in practically every assault against us for the next two decades. Now, get that. When Canada was attacked, there was the Clearwater Police. When the IRS went after our churches and you, there was the Clearwater Police Department. And right in Florida, the city had attempted to enact an ordinance against the church and literally on the same day we received IRS recognition, that ordinance was also struck down in a scathing decision by the Court of Appeals. So October the 1st, 1993 was not a good day for the SP powers that be in Clearwater. And finally, let's add that SP newspaper to the list, the same one who had urged all of these discriminatory actions and who now had egg on their face with the city having to pay us about a million dollars in legal fees for pursuing their illegal case. 
And what else do we now know happened following that fateful IRS victory? Well, first, the German embassy in Washington, D.C. reported back to Germany that our tax exemption was a grave development and frantically advised all stops be pulled in undermining our exemption. Second, Eli Lilly set loose a team of former FBI agents and PR firms to work out the most effective means to discredit Scientology. And where did they decide to lead their assault? In Germany, by bringing the SP government on board. They chose Clearwater because it is the home of our Mecca, and what better target to attack since their losses were so great? Further, it was the one local government in America still antagonistic to the church, with their newspaper being the only source of N theta on our recognition in 1993, quoting both the police chief and mayor's disapproval. So this was the stage, and these were the players that converged for the last big enemy assault in the United States. And make no mistake, that was precisely what was behind that assault. They were just looking for anything to get us. Because absolutely nothing the media reported about that case had any part in reality, as we now know. The police began their inquisition, but as their files just released this week show, they knew there was nothing untoward from the first week. But that wouldn't stop them, because they had a ready and willing ally in the local medical examiner who would conduct tests to prove something was wrong. Now, how did she plan to get away with that? Easy. As soon as she concocted her false results, she destroyed the evidence. Literally, that's what she did. I'm not joking. What else do we know? She was a heavy supporter of Prozac and couldn't stand the fact that CCHR, CCHR by name, found out about newly caused deaths of Prozac before she could say it was something else. Again, no joke. But let's not forget, the black PR campaign is what fostered this assault. And while the first stories emanated from Clearwater, they were actually written by German reporters. Now, of course, we've known that datum for years, but that's not the full story. And again, this comes from police files withheld from us until this week. These files show the German media was secretly meeting with the police the whole time, but that's still not the big secret, because it turns out those reporters were identifying themselves to the police as representatives of the German government. That's right, they were actually German intelligence. But as I said, I could give you intrigue all night. <laughs> the real mystery is how the state officials ever thought they could get away with this. And the answer is simple, with generalities. By attacking the church, they didn't have to ever prove any person did anything wrong. Their only strategy was to spread enough black PR and smear everybody. And they had the perfect mouthpiece to do it, the well-named SP Times. In fact, they were hoping the church would do what any other organization does. After all, the only thing at stake, they said, was a $15,000 fine. And what any corporation does is just plead no contest. In other words, accept an injustice so as to save money in having to fight. Well, we're not any other group, and they were given one answer. Wrong. In fact, we went one step further and told them, undo what you've done because it's false. Of course, they told us they never would. Our response? Then we'll make you do it. Just watch. <laughs> Now, this was a very significant point because just winning wouldn't be good enough. We always knew we'd win. Yet how many court cases have you seen when somebody wins but the papers say he may have been ruled not guilty, but that doesn't mean he's innocent? That was no option for us. The only option we would accept is drop your case. However, considering the whole political climate, it's no generality to say attorneys and experts from one end of the country to the other said that was impossible.
and that it would never happen. Why did everybody think it could never happen? Well, it never does. <laughs> plus, <laughs> plus, as they correctly pointed out, this was the lengthiest investigation ever conducted, the most expensive investigation ever conducted, with the most publicity, the most black PR of any case ever in that state. Well, the rest is history because we never say never. While I could detail everything it took to make this happen, it's best summed up this way. By real Scientologists never forgetting the price of freedom. Today, you can add one more first to that list I gave because that case is also now the most embarrassing case ever brought by the state because what never happens was made to happen as they were forced to drop all charges in honor of our maiden voyage on June 12, 2000. <laughs> As I said at the outset, there is a bigger picture and it has to do with the real tech of handling suppression, flourish and prosper. When this began, we had an antagonistic city government, an antagonistic mayor, and a still ongoing 20-year police intelligence investigation. What did we do? Flourish and prosper. We announced and began the construction on our new Mecca, and then the Sandcastle expansion and then continued on persisting until even that police chief ended that 20-year investigation, admitting he couldn't find evidence to charge the church with so much as not paying a parking ticket. But probably the best example is this. Who did the first call of congratulations come from? The city manager and then the city attorney who heads that office that used to specialize in assaulting us. And finally, the mayor himself who said, congratulations, I'm glad we won. And the end result, and the end result of that suppression is this. Today, our Mecca has a safer environment than ever in history with enemies turned to friends and allies. And that's what LRH meant when he told us to flourish and prosper. But even as we celebrate this latest victory, let's not forget the challenges to come. For to rescue a planet from the teeth of suppression and set six billion free is, to say the least, a highly adventurous undertaking. It demands supreme dedication, supreme commitment, and not a little courage. It also requires a fully cohesive and coordinated effort on the part of every Scientologist. And that's, of course, what the International Association of Scientologists is all about. You've just heard those words, religious recognition, in a highly significant and very positive context. But there's a flip side to this statement, and it's something we must never forget. Because the fact is, the well-intentioned people of this world are not the only ones on this planet who intuitively recognize Scientology. Suppressants also know exactly who we are and what we represent. So yes, we have every reason to celebrate this evening. And yes, our recent victories mark a considerable advancement for freedom of all mankind. But let's not forget that ultimate price of freedom as LRH defined it. Constant alertness, constant willingness to fight back. There is no other price. That such responsibility falls on just a few shoulders is an unfortunate fact of existence at this time. Yet by the same token, there will definitely come a day, 10, 20, 100 years up the track, when you can very truthfully say, I was not only there, I was on the team. 
Your efforts and your support have made and will continue to make all the difference. And as we gather here tonight, armed with LRH tech, our ultimate victory over global suppression is assured. But our ultimate victory depends upon expanding our numbers and on the unswerving continued commitment of every IAS member. It's that simple. It's that vital. And as we continue working toward that ultimate victory and the realization of our aims, remember these words from LRH. The guys in the white hats with the S and double triangle are winning. They're winning because they mean well. They do good. They know their business. And the enemy is losing and will lose because they mean bad. They do evil. They are incompetent. Remember the principle of flourish and prosper. It works. And the next time you see an attack, remember the old truth. This too shall come to pass away. But not Scientology. We're here and will be here for all the decades and centuries that this civilization has left to it. We are saving beings, not men. And the evil die within their own generation. We don't. So the next time you feel blue, read this. The enemy can't even plan for tomorrow. We work in eternity. To LRH. <laughs> Plan, dressed as a man, walking the earth since he began. So our next chapter is chapter 12, the LSD purification pilot. And that's pretty interesting about how David Miscavige completely altered the usual purification program as a punishment. Of course, I got to do that punishment and I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, thank you for watching. Press the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you soon. Bye.